it's fascinating and there's a lot to unpack, including this relationship between wisdom and belonging. I mean, when I asked you about the meaning crisis, you say that it seems to be almost synonymous with the poverty of wisdom. But then at the same time, you're talking about the uh, effects of this meaning crisis, the sadness, the nihilism, mm -hmm. uh, as seemingly motivated by a lack of sense of belonging. Are these two therefore connected in some way, wisdom and belonging? Yes, I think so. Um, now that's also a long argument. Um, and, and that doesn't mean I don't, you know, if, if you want to challenge me on anything, that's fine. But I, I can't, I'm just saying I'm gesturing towards arguments. Um, uh, and this is an argument about that, the, the way in which we make sense of the environment, this is sort of um, coming out of what's called 4E cognitive science. There are aspects of that that are non-propositional in nature. They're not about the inferential modification of our beliefs. They're about the procedural modification of our skills, uh, the per perspectival modification of um, our situatedness, our orientation, um, the participatory modification of our sense of self and identity. And, and the idea there is that many of the connections, um, if you ask people what meaning in life or belonging means, they'll give you connectedness metaphors. They, they don't feel like they're connected like to something larger than themselves. It's, of course, a metaphor. Like if I chained them to a mountain, they wouldn't be happy or anything like that. So they're trying to convey, this is what Susan Wolf talks about in her book, uh, Meaning in Life at Why It Matters. They're trying to convey that they're connected to something that they would want to exist even if they did not. And that they feel that they're making a difference to that. And those can, that sense of connectedness, is, a lot of it is non-propositional in nature. And it has to do with the ways in which people are cultivating skills and sensibilities and characters um, that home them. Um, now, I think a lot of that is also where, we, when we're talking about wisdom as distinct from knowledge, people are trying to point. You know, knowledge is about overcoming ignorance with evidence, and it's about what. Uh, wisdom is much more about overcoming foolishness with relevance, and it's more about how. And I think a lot of that how is carried in that non-propositional. And so I think that's the relationship between wisdom and belonging. I think one way of understanding the the meaning crisis is um, uh, there's been a there's been this uh, I would argue this drift. Uh, from Descartes on, uh, increasing emphasis on the propositional at the expense um, of the non-propositional, of kind of propositional tyranny. The propositional uh, in sort of sacrifice of the of the non-propositional. I, I, it's it's interesting I, when I think about these uh, traditional centers of meaning that you've spoken about, and you've used the the word religious at least once in the context of saying yes. pseudo religious, yes. modern political movements. But uh, I think traditionally we're talking about religion here. And I've always uh, been struck by the fact, I shouldn't say always, I guess more recently in my life, been struck by the fact that for all the time we spend arguing about analytic philosophy and propositional logic and syllogisms, if you look into the places that are traditionally thought of as the centers of wisdom, you don't find propositional logic. You don't find mm. syllogisms. Yeah. What you find yeah. is something like narrative. And so I wonder if this has something to do with a removal of narrative from modern society. When I think about uh, you know, uh, successful societies of the past, they seem to have things like an origin story. They seem mm -hmm. to have, mm -hmm. you know, the, the birth of the nation is important to a national identity. You know, Americans would talk about the founding fathers as if they were quoting hadiths of the prophet, you know what I mean? Now, I think, I, I mean, I, I, I would say it's, it's probably the case in the UK. Uh, I'm not so sure about it in America, uh, given that you have a, a, a much more solid founding story, I think, than the UK does. But I noticed that that seems to have sort of dropped out of conversation a little bit. Do you think that that might have something to do with this? I, I think that's an excellent observation. Uh, I think that narrative, well, think about how narrative, obviously there's propositions in narrative, but as you've already indicated that it's not its main function. I think Daniel Hudo's work on the narrative practice hypothesis, like why do we do narrative so damn much? We're doing it all the time, all day long. You meet somebody, you want their narrative. What happened to you today? You go to like blah, blah, blah. And he's trying to argue it seems like second nature to us, but that seems to be belied by the fact that we seem to be practicing it so much. We do, you know, we do this ghostly dialogue with pre-linguistic children. We, we act as if, you know, we're talking to them and we do the narrative back and forth on their behalf. 
and and his argument, and a lot of people I think are in agreement with this, is that what you know what narrative does is narrative is is what you use to become sort of a temporally extended cognitive and moral agent. It gives you non-propositional kinds of identities, like you have the identity of the character before and after the story begins, right, are not the same, uh, you know, in a logical sense. There's a narrative continuity. There's development, and and you need all of this. He argues in order to uh, <clears throat> pick up on everything that is needed to actually properly interpret the propositions. So if I say to you, like, um, no, so let, let's do it this way. I'll put you in the viewer's view. You see somebody and they say something you know is not true and you know they know it's not true. Well, well did they lie? Well, Hudo argues, well, you need to know, like, what's their character, right? Uh, what's the context they're in? What's happening in this situation? Are they in conflict? Like, what's, you need all of that. And then he points out, well, that's what narrative is getting you to practice to do. It's getting you to practice all those skills, those skills and that perspective taking. Narrative's all about perspective taking. It's all about identity transformation. And I think you're bang on. I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that narrative is really capturing. It's a machine for capturing the non-propositional and using it to make us temporally extended cognitive and moral agents. And I think you're right. When we lose, the, when we lose narrative in that fashion, as you've said, um, I, I think we, 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 we've, we've significantly hamstrung um, the way we cultivate uh, people's capacity to belong, to to find that connectedness. Now, I would say there's also well, in the book that I wrote with, with Chris and Philip, we talked about three orders. We talked about a narrative order that has been lost. Uh, we talk about a, a normative order. The, the ancient world, for example, as, a, after the Axial Revolution, right? It has a two worlds mythology that gives you sort of a way of understanding transcendence and, and improvement. That's largely been destroyed, uh, uh, I think, by, by the scientific worldview. And then we have a nomological order. Now, of course, science has given us better grasp on the nomological aspects of the world, but science has not really fitted us well into that nomos. And so I think we've lost actually all three orders. I'll just give you one thing that's kind of interesting about this. You know, one of the thing, one of the things people say is like a symptom of what's happening right now is the is the virtual exodus. People preferring to live in the virtual world uh, rather than the real world. There's a couple good books around this, and it's become problematic. You know, it's it's problematic for a, uh, a very significant subpopulation in Japan right now. But anyways, think about a video game and think about what it gives you. Right, you get the rules. But the rules are, they, they're relevant to you. You fit them. You know how to fit into that nomological structure. There's, there's a narrative and you know what your role is in that narrative. And of course, you know how to level up. <laughs> it's clearly part of the game. And so you can see that these games are so attractive. I mean, there's other things they're doing with sensory motor and, you know, gratification, but they're so, also so attractive uh, because they're supplying, uh, in, in, at least temporarily, a sense of belonging to these missing orders.